looks flat, no foreground. I think the shadows are too light. Too light? Hmm, interesting. Interesting opinions. Fog too bright. Cast shadow. We'll go out on a limb and say no cast shadows. Excellent! No cast shadows. Too much empty space to the left. Excellent! Um, need some atmosphere. Beautiful! No cast shadows. Nice! That's what I'm looking for. Not dark enough because uh, the room is so dark. Uh, the room is too dark. We don't want to, you know, if we if we were photographers and we're walking around a submarine and we're trying to take pictures of everything, would we take pictures of empty dark rooms? No. We would have to have substantial lighting. Um, and what's happening here is that you have this powerful light source that you've established as a really, really powerful source of a lot of light. But what we don't see is the reaction of the environment to that light. So this fella right here, oh, this is going to be tough. Wish me luck. Um, okay, how do I do this? Let me see. All right, power of the lasso. So this piece right here, this piece right here. So what we're talking about is a light source that's in the room. What have I said? Does anyone remember what I said about light sources that are inside the room? What happens to them? What happens to light sources inside the room? What do they do to our composition? Okay. They are the light that is dominant, that is releasing or revealing the major, um, the major sort of form description of everything in the, whoops, of everything in the canvas. So it means everything is not only responding to that, but adapting its color. So when we have a light source that is inside the environment, everything becomes multiplied. Everything becomes crazy. We have, we need reactions to everything. Look at what happened when I added these rim lights on the sides of anything that was a cube or cube based before, after. There is suddenly a light environment. When I say light environment, I'm really, really talking about whether or not the primary light source is dominant, whether or not the primary light source has controlled um, the, 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 the visibility of all the lights, uh, all the objects, whether or not the, the dominant light source has changed the color of every object towards its own color. Because remember, lights don't just adapt, um, <clears throat> uh, objects don't just adapt the, the, the brightness of the light source, they adapt its color as well. So you need to remember that color is something that is carried as well. It's not just white. Um, are you fucking kidding me? Don't worry, you're not in trouble and your account standing is not affected by this. Either there are ads running on your video with the revenue going to the copyright owner or the copyright owner is receiving stats about your video's views. A copyright claim was created for content in Isterbrack Art Instructor Life. Are you fucking serious? There are no problems, you don't need to take any action, you don't need to delete your video. If something went wrong and copyright owner or our system made a mistake, we have a dispute process. Only use, if you are confident, you have the rights to use all the content in your video. Does it record it and upload it on YouTube? I'm sorry guys, that's bullshit, I wasn't even there for like fucking five minutes. Well, not true. But holy shit, like I even turned off the music. Oh my god, there's like so many, there are so many hurdles and so many people you don't want to offend. And all you want to do is just upload some music and draw. Ah. Okay, so I'm gonna... It didn't, it didn't upload the video. The video is not on my videos, is it? The stream that I did didn't upload. So why is it... God, that pisses me off so bad. I wasn't even like... I didn't even do anything. <laughs> a copyright claim? Like, suck my dick, yo. Go copyright claim. You want to take this to court or something? Like, chill. I'm sorry. It just really pisses me off. Damn it. Okay. Um, so what happens is not only do the sides of these minor cubes get some light on them. Very sorry about that. Uh, but the sides of the walls get a brighter reflection. And what's more important is that the sides of these walls are casting a very, very sharp shadow. When I asked, you know, is the light source in the room, basically what I'm asking is how sharp are these cast shadows? Because to create a light environment, the cast shadows have to be visible. And we can't have cast shadows if 
the light is far away. We can't have those kinds of light sh cast shadows, the really, really sharp ones. So what we need to do is up our sh cast shadow game. Yeah. And the cast shadows are very sharp because the light source is so close, it's in the actual photograph. It's in, it's in, the, it's in the drawing. Okay, so this cast shadow will be really close to its owner. What I'm going to do very crudely, I'm very sorry about this quality. It's because of the time constraint. I don't have time to draw through every nook and cranny. If you guys have like really massive illustrations like this, I would love to have access to the layers. Like it would be so much easier on me if I could just get a hold of those layers. <clears throat> There's that cast shadow. I'm sorry, this is really, really messy. These are just the general areas where you would find these cast shadows. I'm using a hard round brush, if anyone's curious. Most boring brush known to man. Okay. And then this cast shadow would be somewhere very, very close. So it wouldn't be far away and it wouldn't be fuzzy. Does anyone know when we do have um, objects that are far away and fuzzy? I mean, cast shadows that are far away and fuzzy? Anyone remember? Um, okay, so that's counted for. We have to lower the intensity of some of these. And this one here, I forgot about this one. So once I do the before and after on this, you'll really see the effect respecting your light environment like this has on your image. It creates an environment, an atmosphere. Now, who doesn't want atmosphere in their painting? Everybody wants atmosphere in their painting because it's a sense of realism, a sense of air, a sense of uh, presence of the light source in the image. If you ignore that, you're going to have an image that makes no sense scientifically, like physically, with the way the light is behaving. And you're going to have an image that's not really attractive. If there's like a fusion reactor, um, or I don't know, is this portal? Is this something to do with portal 2 or something? Um, if there is something that is that powerful where it's creating some sort of as, as some, the fuel or something like that of the ship, there is going to be some major, major illumination and highlight happening in this, in this composition. We're going to see some of that. In this image. So let me show you the before and after. Everybody ready? And um, most importantly, when you do have a light source, does anyone know what else is needed for the light source? So this is the physics rule. Let me know if you guys know what I'm talking about, the correction, what the correction is I'm looking for, if anyone can see it. So we've got object A and the light source. Light source bounces back, bounces back, bounces back. What's missing in this image? It's kind of a, a riddle, but... What's missing in this image that we see in this diagram? Bounces back. How about these lights? So this is the bounce back, and this is the light source. So there's a bunch of the rays, which are act like vectors, emerging from the light source that's inside the canvas, which means we are seeing its utmost brightness. We're not seeing half of it where the canvas is here and the light source is here. We're not seeing some of it. We're seeing all of it. So what is missing? Only when you're close to the ground, the part, reflective light, reflection. Um, I'm looking for a very specific word. It starts with G. <laughs> Can anyone see what, what it is? This is reflection. Yeah, this is what's happening. They're reflecting back. But how about here? The word isn't reflection if we're looking at this. And the hint is what's happening here and what's happening here. A weaker light from the diffuse. No. I'll give you guys like 20 more seconds to figure it out. Gradient. Ambient light. Uh, almost there. Glare. No. Gostics? No, it's not glare. <laughs> no. It's a very specific word and you guys don't remember it because you guys don't um, use this. You guys forget about this tiny last little... Um, yes, glow. Thank you. That's the glow. When we have a light source that's inside 
the image, what happens is a glow. Now you have it here, but it also happens when you when objects reflect off of uh, when light reflects off of other objects. So where else can we have some flow glow? Not flow glow. So it's going to be. I usually put it on soft light. Soft light is like the nicest kind of way to add in some light. So there's that glow. You've got some of that. Then there's this glow. This glow. The glow on the sides of these. So these needed their own little light, but because they're curved, I couldn't do it. Let's let's do this properly. I'll erase the sides so that it's a actually edge work, not half-assed. Sorry, I'm just a perfectionist. It really, you know, the before and after has to be clean for me to feel like I've done a good job. And then we've got the glow. Okay, so light source, glow, glow, glow. This is even more um, uh, proof that the light source is, is sitting there, that the light is causing all of this to be visible. There are also going to be some cast shadows at the top here, really, really strong cast shadows, because this is the light source, and this air, you have some of it there. But it needs to be a little bit stronger because this whole area is getting the light. Okay, so I'm just going to, whoopsie, do that. Okay. This is all light environment talk. This is all the most, really the most important stuff. Um, you can't take shortcuts with this kind of stuff because it makes or break, breaks the environment of your painting. And when they say environment concepts, this is what they're talking about. You as the artist um, who's, who's designing this environment, you have to remember how do I create an environment and the light source is the most important tool at your disposal for creating light, light like for creating environments in general. It needs to be a little brighter. Duplicate layer, merge down. But remember this top half, you always want to close off your canvas. So even though it is bright, you got to close the top off and make it darker because you don't want the eyes to be too attracted to anywhere outside of the canvas. As for this whole area here, this area is too, too dark. It is too dark. You have to crop your image so that it can feel completed. Look how complete it is. And then you had all this extra uh, space that was attracting my eye away that wasn't letting me see this. So I recommend a crop or you bring in some more info here because you really have nothing going on in this area. So one thing you could do, um, if you want to keep this area and not crop it off, the easier thing to do would be to crop it off. But um, we don't always want to just uh, cut off the, the work that we did. So what I'm going to do is just show you how you could kind of still get the light involved. So see these little rims on the sides of this um, ground area, like the, I don't know what they're called, the, the grooves, the trenches. This, these areas, we can also add some of the light environment in it. And now the light is involved here. You don't want to make it look like it's glowing, so you're going to have to erase some of it away. Oh, wrong layer. Okay. Just a little bit, just so that this light, it becomes attached to this part of the image so that it doesn't feel so empty anymore. That's why it felt empty, because the light's like, okay, I only have uh, jurisdiction in this area, and then I lose all jurisdiction here. Why? That's not possible. The, the wall of, that we're against right now, the cameraman is against a wall, uh, maybe. Uh, that wall also gets some light. The, the cameraman will also be visible. Another thing that you're uh, missing here is the reflectivity and the glow on these, on these little wood pieces. This is the light source and it is directly involved in this environment. 
So there's going to be a color and intensity mirroring. So I'm going to get this exact color and just throw it over the ground. I'm not going to make it a brownish version. No, this is really reflective like woodwork here. If that's what it is and that's what's causing this to be visible. This whole area is reflective. This little um, belt it's also going to get some highlight. But what the difference is in this case, this is more reflective than anywhere else. This little belt here is more reflective anywhere than anywhere else in the image. So it's going to reflect some of the light back, but it's going to reflect it back this way. And then it maybe might have a little other reflection off the sides of other areas here that are causing more reflection. Because it's kind of working like a mirror. Just like that. And it gets really intense wherever it gets close to the light. So now this feels actually reflective. Maybe another one just down this way. And it works like a mirror reflecting back what, what's inside the image already. So you see this um, this uh, cylinder is going to get reflected. And that's how you work with mirrors. You just have to look around the environment. The environment around is what's reflected. And if there's enough light in the room, the mirror will reflect what's in the room. You just have to give the mirror enough light. Oops. So these little thingies are also reflecting back very, very gently. Just along the edge of this ground piece. And I'm going to just lower the opacity on that. Erase away the edges, trying to keep it so that this far area is the brightest area. And merge that down, merge that down. Sorry I'm not looking at the... I see how Mr. Rack put that white uh, line across along the glass. Um, this will be next week. Yeah, eyes are next week, guys. Uh, what's the question? Haunted moose? The edge will glow a lot coming from the light source. That edge will glow. Um, no, next week is eyes. I'm sorry, guys. Um, then I'm going to get, no, oh no, I'm going to get uh, color dodge. And I'm going to create more reflection along this edge right here. I don't think color dodge will do it. Select. Yes, it will. And there will be just a little bit more reflection just coming off this light here and reflecting back. It's not just going to sit there on one side and it's just going to be completely uh, dark. But remember this edge, this, this border of shadow that sits on the image. And then finally, these plates here need a little bit more of a gradient. Okay, so this is the polygonal lasso tool. For those who are asking about it, maybe I might be confused. Oops, why did I do that? <clears throat> uh, this tool is awesome if you want to get some really clean lines and also lasso select some stuff. What I'm going to do is keep the outsides of these little pieces here so that we don't have to crop darker, but I'm going to light them up the closer they get to the light source. Because remember, the light source is what's allowing this image to be visible. It is the god of the image. Ask any professional, any master study you're ever going to do, that's what you're going to realize. You're going to realize all the light on any object has the same temperature and has the same DNA as the light that is controlling the image. Either it's the sunlight outside of the image or anything inside of the image. Uh, light source wise. So I'm going to get this light source color. Remember, you're drop tooling the exact color of the light source. You're not going in here and choosing another one. No, you're getting the exact one that the light source has because you're trying to create an environment. So I'm going to do a little halo just like this right along the edges. And it's going to get a little hotter the closer it gets to the light source. And that's it. Before, after. Do you guys see that involvement? The light source is controlling the image. And I'll show you guys the before and after now. But before I do, any questions? There are probably a lot more areas here where we might have some cast shadows. For instance, this, yeah, this whole area here is supposed to be a cast shadow. Oh, there's a light here. Yeah, actually, there will still be a cast shadow. It'll be like an overlap light. So it'll work like this.
than anywhere outside of that. So it gets brighter because there's a light source, but it's still pretty dark. Because it's getting closer to the light casting it. And then outside of it, I'm going to get a new layer. This area becomes bright because the light is on it. Okay. So let me erase some of this stuff here. I'm not sure if I'll have time for everybody's today because light is really just that, you know, it's a black hole of a lesson because there's just so much involved. It's all about light. Light is just everything to do with a painting. So this is not going to be that sharp. I have to get the blur tool and uh, clean that up. But that's definitely one of the major cast shadows on this image. What will happen though is it won't be this dark because I'm depending too much on contrast right now. It'll be a little fuzzier. Just a little bit. The light source is in the room, remember. And um, that's it. Now we don't have to crop. Um, other areas that I think would be a really cool addition is, you see how reflective these cylinders are? They're practically glass. I recommend, see that glow? That, that glow is really important. This is a pure mirror surface. The specular on this is off the charts. So what will happen is they will be reflective as well as on, on, a, on a vanishing point. So if you don't know where to place the light on these, it's just a vanishing point that it works off of. This one will, might should be a little bit higher. All light vectors are vanishing points that emerge and emanate from the center of light, from the center of the light. I'm going to get a color layer. I'm going to get this exact light because this is the light that's reflecting on everything. And this will be the light reflected back off of these cylinders. These reds that you have on them, are, I know they're coming out of these little red pieces, but these aren't strong enough to cancel out that, that light source. So if you add them, you have to add them in on a very, very small margin. And I, I just, I think you should clean this whole area up, make these um, reflective pieces like here a little bit more um, visible because they're mirroring everything in the room, so you're going to have to go through all of it. And uh, let me get a new layer, actually. Sorry about the delay of the for of the fourteen to challenge. Delay of the uh, before and after. So I'm just going to add more of these reflective bars. Remember, a mirror is at its efficient, most efficient shape when it's flat. That's when it will reflect back everything in the same angle. So. If you, if you go to a circus and you go to those funky mirrors, your image will change, your reflection will change because the surface of the mirror that's catching all that light, reflecting your image back, is distorted. So anywhere where you have a distorted image, a uh, distorted mirror, you're going to have a distorted image. So everybody ready for the before and after? Damn it, oh, fuck this tablet. Sorry. Before. After. Before after. Light is part of this entire um, environment. This, this, this blue light here is really important. There's going to be some cast shadows along here. Sorry about that. Maybe a little sharper. So before, after. Are these things bars or are they edges? If they're edges, there will be a, an edge. Before, after. The room is alive now. You feel like you can actually move in there. And that's because the light environment has been reinforced. The light has been crowned as the leader of this of this painting. So I'm just doing a before and after. A lot of pros when they're ch when they're drawing and they don't know really what they're doing um, with their light, they do a before and after and they turn this on and off to see if they're missing anything, if anything is too strong these bars here, this is very crudely added. You, you, might, you might want to go in and create some breaks in the bars. The bars aren't perfectly smooth. Um, but uh, do you guys see what looks like paint on the wall? Oh yeah? Yeah, or bars. Oh no, I think it's pipes. It could be pipes. Yeah, or paint. But yeah, does anyone have any questions? Let me show you. Before, 
after. Does anyone think that there are, um, think the thing on the walls are pipelines? Yeah, they are. So let me, uh, let me fix that. Okay. And they will have their own reflection of the light on them as well. But no questions? No questions on, you know, no arguments about what the changes that I made? Uh, does anyone disagree? down before sorry before after and this can all be done in a, a degree less than this if you don't want the light to feel this strong you still have to show off the side of this uh, the side the sides of these cubes in this light environment you still have to show us some kind of reaction to this light source it can't be so uh, muted and dark if it's so, if the light source is so strong and inside the canvas. Okay, this is the kind of stuff they expect out of you for those crazy studios that, that really want the high level of realism. They have a whole department dedicated to, probably not a whole department, but they have special artists dedicated to just making the light look right. Because without the light, things just look very flat. You can tell what's been over-textured. Light controls how much texture is visible. Light controls how much saturation is visible. How much detail is visible. That's crazy. That's a crazy amount of control and a crazy amount of power for something that you guys have been ignoring in your drawings. So light is that thing that if you're not studying it right now, you should start studying it. There's a lot in art that we have to study, I know. There's a, there's a great deal of work to be done. But if you want to start somewhere, start with lighting. Okay, so how do I start with lighting? Do some form studies. Form studies really get you um, just right in there, right in the thick of it. Uh, studying how light reflects off of flat surfaces, doing multiple polygons. Um, it helps you discover how objects without closeness to the light fade in detail, fade into the distance. Um, it also helps you experiment with um, depth which um, which form studies are more distant than the ones close up, details are more visible than the ones close up, high contrast than the ones close up, etc. <clears throat> lots and lots of details um, in, in the lesson of art, in the lesson of light. I can't really cover them here. If I continue talking about light, I'll never stop. Um, but that's for this one. I still recommend, if, unless you add something interesting here, whoa, add something interesting here, or maybe a person here, um, I still recommend a crop, at least on the outer edge. You still want some emptiness, so you want breathing room, but not that much breathing room. You probably should do something like that. If you want this copy back, please message me on my Facebook um, group, and I will contact you there. <clears throat> um, this piece right here is a bit of an anatomy issue. So let's look at this cat from the side. You only know how to draw cats from the so from up front view. So this is what you've practiced. And what's that what that has led to, everyone pay attention, that has led to to a dependency on that angle of the cat that you only that the only angle of the cat that you know, which is drawing a cat front view. Right now what's expected of you is to think of the cube instead of thinking of the cube like this. Oops. Thinking of the cube like this. Um Okay, this is really bad. Uh, you have to think of the cube like this. Oopsie. So the cat's eyes should have been down here. And the cat's head, the top of its head, the top part of its cube, of its head, everything is, has cubes in it, by the way, should have been more visible. So what have you done wrong here? You've given us a camera that's pretty high looking down at the cat, and what's happened is, let's look at this from a different angle. So this is the cameraman, and this is us, and this is the canvas that we're looking at. Top part here, bottom part here. All right, everybody with me? This camera is looking at a cat that has done this. Its spine has pointed down, but all of a sudden there was a break in its spine, and the head is now facing forward. This is the face. This is the face of that cube I was trying to draw. 
So what you've done, I think naturally the spine would control where the head is going if the spine is pointing down. So have you ever like bowed down to someone and then tried to look up? You can't do that. You can't break your neck so that it does this. It breaks that spine and then you look up again. What happens is you have to follow the spine. The spine controls the direction of that gesture. So what will happen is the cat will be looking up, yeah, in a menacing way. It'll be growling and stuff. But we see the top of the head because the camera sees the top of the head. This is where we are, right here, right here. So you need to see the sh you need to show the top of the head of that cat because it looks really, really wrong. This is the kind of um, you know, uh, like when you jump into combining two kinds of um, anatomy together, like a cat and a snake. You have to think about how you can combine them to make them both make sense. <clears throat> so, uh, so. Does anyone have any questions so far about what this this issue is right here before I paint over it? So what I'm going to do is jump into liquify and um, Bismillah. <laughs> it's going to be very tough. I'm going to try to show the top of the head of the cat as best as I can. And it'll look a lot more right if we do it that way. So less of the mouth is visible. More of the snout is visible. Come here, glasses. You have to look up a good reference on how the fa cat's face contorts when it's um when it's really angry. You know that that crazy face that it does. I love I love um. His face is on cats. They're so cute. I, I really don't know what to do with the mouth. I'd have to look up a reference. Cat hissing. Oh my god, they're so cute. <clears throat> okay, so the, this thing goes up this way. And this thing is a little more angry. And this thing is like completely like closed off, so this whole area needs to be closed off. Okay, just like that. And this bit right here needs to get tucked in right under. Okay, so let's see what this correction did. Actually, before I do that, I have to connect this fur to this fur because we would see that the way the spots continue through. Good job on those cast shadows. It's really made it feel like the environment is there. Very good job on the cast shadows. I'm going to darken up here just a little bit and darken down here. And you need to bring this color just like, I, just like I did with the previous um, image, you need to bring this color onto the cat because you're trying to create a light environment. So look what happens when we bring in that blue ever so gently. So when you choose a color for the light source, that's the color you're choosing. And it's not just choosing the color for the light source, it's choosing the color of the light source on the wash of the image. So the whole image gets that wash on it. You can still have other colors, but those colors will be uh, changed and altered by that blue. So that you can have a, a light source environment that reads, that feels like, yeah, this is in a really, really high mountain area. They finally found this rare animal and its, and its habitat is mostly um, like icy terrain and, and um, I don't know. What's the word for ecosystem? No. What's the word for like, 
Ah, oh, it's the word you were learning in grade three about, like, the tundra and the flatlands. What's the word for those? Like, how you distinguish between them. Like, the term for a different kind of... Anyways, the nose is pink, but it's a bluish pink. And the eyes are green, but they're a bluish green. So flatten biome. Not really a biome, no. That's another... So before, you can make it uh, yell still, but it would uh, feel less like the cat needs to be drawn this way now. After that, so it feels like the cat should be like this way. Or, you know, like sitting down. That's what I feel like the cat should be doing. Because its head is supposed to be respecting, it's supposed to be sitting on its spine. But if its spine is doing this, this doesn't feel right. If it's going to be yelling, we would see more of the teeth, more of the top of the head. There's only so much I can do with a, with a paint over. Before? After. And do you see what that blue did? We still have a cat that's, that's brown. It still looks like a, like a cheetah kind of color. But now the cat has followed its spine. Its spine didn't have to snap. We would see more of this top side because we're seeing the top side of everything. It's like we're bird's eye view on the cat only. Or lift the upper body toward the camera. Um, what you can do uh, with the before is um, if you want to fix it without changing the head because you spent a lot of detail on this is continue the, the gesture this way. So the cat would be holding the rock this way holding the other rock this way or down here so that it's at least following its spine. But here the spine looks like it's completely disconnected from the anatomy of the cat. Uh, let's see a uh, cat bird's eye view. Um, images. Yeah, see it has to, the spine has to be right under the head, not beside it. Let's find a good reference for this. Um, we're seeing the top of the head. The eyes are really low. The top of the head is visible and the spine is right behind it. It's sitting under the spine in a really comfortable position. Um, let's find another reference. Like right here. You see, we're not seeing the back of its, its back from the side. Um, this one is probably your best reference. This is the best one you can do. See how low the lips are? So, um, cat hissing, looking up. Oh gosh. Look at that cuteness. Oh my god. Um, where is it? Hold on. Like, yeah, this one right here, this would be, if we don't see its back, we'd have to see its front. You see, this is the front where you were drawing, but you broke it and added a spine this way. Look at this one, it's so cute. <laughs> um, come on, just give me one good ref for it. Show me the money. <laughs> So maybe I can give this to you if you want to correct it. I don't think we're going to find one. It's a really odd position um, to have a cat in. I guess this one is a good reference, but we don't really see its back. You'd have to snap the back in order for that to work. Oh my god, this photo is perfect. Okay, I'm probably going to be here for another three hours if I can <laughs> turn this off. But before, after. Um, flatten, okay. And I hope that helped. <clears throat> What's next is, uh, that was the weirdest cough, slash gloat there, gloat three -er. throat clear. Okay, this one is so cute because it's Nausicaa. Um, but you've got some issues here. Um, I don't know if you were copying what was in the movie, like it's if it's a movie scene. But I don't think... I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, because it's cartoons and I'm too bent on realism, but I don't think Miyazaki would have designed a, or allowed a composition to be designed where the mountains were stamp repetitions of each other. You need to give these mountain ranges like some sort of unique um, pattern. They 
can't just uh, look like the same mountain repeated over and over again. But this could be the cartoony thing going on. So sometimes it's cute when they do that. Um, it just looks more adorable because, you, you know, you're doing cartoon physics, which is like lack of physics. And this one here, again, same thing. You want to give these some variety. Cut his little head off. Stuff in the foreground is much darker than stuff in the background. Everyone write that back, because I need to know that everybody knows this rule. My voice is cracking like I'm going through puberty again. God knows that that should not happen. Okay. So this, all of this stuff here should be darker. As soon as we do that, it will feel much closer to us. We're bridging that gap. And now everything is a step below this. So it's going to look a little something like... We're basically just darkening. We're using this as the reference point, and everything just darkens in that direction. Again, I don't know, I'm not sure if this is how this looked in the movie, but this should be a little darker. A little less dark than that. And the object in the background is kind of fitting in in the right spot now. It feels like it's an accurate, less, it felt like it was really uh, washed out before. And after we've kind of gave it that extra bit of, um, I guess, control over the depth, that extra bit of depth. Another thing is, again, if this is from the movie, I can't really comment on it, but the clouds also need some variation. And the higher this object goes, it doesn't just get brighter at the top. That's not how you fade something off in the in the foreground, in the background. You just you just literally paint it away. The higher and further it gets from you the more faded it gets. And then you don't bring in the light source color, because the light source color seems to be far away from this canvas. You just lighten the top half of this. And this is actually pretty close to the ground, so it wouldn't make sense that it's this faded. So what you have to do is use the depth rules to your advantage and make it seem like there are also clouds in the distance that are causing this um, to disappear, because it just wouldn't disappear like this this close up in the foreground. That's why it doesn't feel right. So you might want to add a little bit more cloud coverage to make it feel like it's a little bit more in the uh, kind of like um, lots of congestion that's causing this to be very, very foggy. Because this is pretty close to the ground. Like if it was this tiny with this many clouds, then it would be this faded. It would be this color. But this is pretty close to the ground. So this either you darken this bit. It's like it's landing or something. Either you darken this this bit right here, or you, uh, or you shrink it. That's another amazing thing that you guys can do with your canvases, um, is create scale. When we use size variation to our advantage, what we create is more depth. We add to the depth. So what you can do is, let's take a gander at this. Um, toss that in there. Come on. Okay. Let's shrink this fella. And you'll actually feel like he's a little bit more in the distance. And we'll fade him accordingly. Remember, when something is in the distance, it has less detail. And this is all stuff you learn when you do the, the form studies. And he'll actually feel like he's in the distance. So scale is very, very important. It's not just about um, sh changing the value of, the, of an object and saying, okay, this is in the, in the distance. No, you have to use scale. There's different ways to create scale um, in depth in the image, and scale is one of them. Um, another one of these is the detail shift. So you're adding lots of detail on this, even though it's supposed to be in the distance. So you're adding even more of a reason for this to feel like it's landing. So is it landing? Is that is that what you're doing? Because that's the kind of the only thing I would see is making sense here. 
So you're adding detail, you're making it almost as large or larger than this object here. And this is another comment on scale. This guy should be a little bit more, a little bit more um, large. He's like a massive giant, is he not? In the, uh, in the movie? So he would be a little bigger. Whoopsie. Cancel. Select inverse. No, that's not going to work. I'm just going to select him. If he's just a little bit bigger, and this is just a little bit smaller, It would make a little bit more sense for why this is so big. Actually, I want to raise it up a little. Yeah, this would be good right here. So you guys see how important it is to learn these rules before you try them in a canvas? And all of these are suggestions, and it is a cartoon. Like, it is something that has been drawn. Um, and they make lots of choices that are you know, kid-friendly. They're not worried about atmospheric depth when it comes to a children's movie, I'm sure. Um, but if you're the artist and you're illustrating, uh, there's a lot of stuff you have to learn. And um, depth and the rules of depth uh, are one of those rules that you really have to learn. So it feels like it's more of a controlled composition than it did before, but this also feels as colossal as it should have felt. Again, if it's landing, that's different. And you can just make this size of the guy with this size of the um, of the floating island. And it would feel like it's really landing. But keep, keep that in mind. Um, it's a suggestion. And I think that'll help you sort of get what you need. Remember this background here. If you if you wanna if you wanna detail anything, detail the sides of these mountains here. Uh, so where's the lighting coming from? Probably this direction. You can detail the sides of these mountains and give them a little bit more detail like that, and that'll that'll complete the image. A couple more pieces. Here, remember, mountains cast shadows on themselves. Just like that, now we have a little bit more detail. So don't throw more detail on this. If it's way up in the sky at an altitude almost as distant as this, because look at the detail level we needed to make these mountains read. Very little, it's two shades. And you've got all these lines here. Lines are dangerous. Be careful with what you what you do with what you do with lines. They're very tricky. Um, so does anyone have any questions? Um, let me close that. Um, be sure to follow the stream. Anyone who's new, Sirac has classes every Tuesday and Thursday right here. Let's get to that sub button. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I was going to say it looked smaller, but because it was in the distance, it looked started to look even bigger. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. It, when you move, like, uh, it feels bigger because it's in the distance and it's still that size, so it still feels colossal. It's still going to feel colossal, but when it's that close up, and we're talking about the floating island, if it was that close up, it would have taken the entire space of the sky in the canvas. So you, you, have to, you have to know, like, relative, okay, the robot relative to the island would be this size, but there's cartoon physics, you know, they break all kinds of rules, and it's okay because it's lines and cell shading. And that's what makes, I guess, that's what makes um, children's movies so nice. As, as artists, we see, you know, it's just a big break for the for the main artist, for the lead artist. Just a big break from physics and all that crazy stuff that we study day to day. And um, that's it. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.